Right, so hello everyone, I'm Jordan, I'm <coughs> first speaker of the evening. So quickly, a uh, very little context about me. I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. Now I'm presenting just my work, I'm not representing the university in any capacity for the sake of the feed. Um, but yeah, I'm a last year PhD student and I'm working in the Robust Autonomy and Decisions Group. And my thesis, which is I'm about to talk about, is mainly sitting at the area called human-robot interaction, and there are two main threads going on there. It's, the first one is representation learning, and the second one is actually teaching you know, actual robots doing stuff. Um, I had somebody once ask me, if you're doing robotics, is it with real robots? It is with real robots, and we have a bunch of them like these in the lab. Now, unfortunately, tonight I'm gonna talk about only the, I'm, I'm gonna talk only about the representation learning side of things, uh, but maybe next time I can talk about the other stuff. Um, for the sake of everybody's clarity, I didn't know what kind of crowd I would get, so this is a fairly broad talk. And it's again about my topic, and I don't know if it's gonna be super useful to you, but I hope you might learn something cool walking away. Um, that being said, we can start with a simple example, which will try to illustrate my main point. So if we look on the screen, we have 10 data points. There are a couple of observations we can make about that, these data points. First one being that they're wrongly indexed. No zero indexing, but if we ignore that, obviously there are 10 data points. Um, each data point is cons uh, comprised of 16 squares, so it's 16 dimensional, and each square can be yellow, uh, not yellow, but white or black. So it's essentially a 16 dimensional binary data. But if you look closely, you might actually say that it's a real value data because uh, you know you have a bunch of great data points here and there. So that's nice, but if we look much closely, the more interesting bit about this data set is that there are certain patterns appearing there, meaning that in a single four by four image, there's a single column, so to speak, that's active at a time. So that means that you know we can essentially use a single number, which lives in a single dimensional space, to sort of explain the variability between the different data points. And that's sort of the, the main idea here, that even though we have a 16 dimensional space, which we can't even plot, because it's 16 dimensions and we usually think in 3D, um, the whole variability in the data set can be explained by a single number. Um, and so that's pretty cool, because then I can give you a number like this, and you can pretty easily generate a, a new image or an image that's part of the data set I had there. Um, simply because, you know, basically you know what the concept there is. Like you can use a simple bar plotting algorithm, so to speak. Um, and again, if you want to cope with the noise there as well, you might say that instead of four discrete data points, that's interesting, uh, you have four Gaussian distributions, right? And the noise sort of comes from sampling from that stochastic process, which is the distribution. But again, the key observation there is that the data we have is 16 dimensional. However, it only lives in a small neighborhood, so to speak, of those 16 dimensions. And that's why we can almost compress it to a single dimension, which would still represent the same idea. Um, so if we think about this, you know, compression and decompression bit as sort of modules that are parameterized by certain parameters. In the previous case, the bar plotting algorithm could be the blue, the blue module and the red module could be a column identifying module, so to speak. So you get your image and you basically decide which column is active at the time. So that's pretty easy and that's meant to, to sort of illustrate what I mean by compression, when I say compression in the title, I'm not a compression expert by no means. Um, however, it's not that clear where these parameters come from, right? In the easy example, it's just a bar plotting algorithm, but in more complicated scenarios, the, those are not so trivial to sort of derive. Uh, it's also not that clear where does Z come from, right? In our case, it was one dimension designating which column is active. If you work with real images, for example, maybe you have an image of a cat, and best case scenario, you want your Z dimensional space to sort of contain certain qualitative aspects of the image. So maybe we wanna say that the, the object or the, the living thing is a cat, it's fluffy, it's gray, etc. However, it's not also quite clear whether comprising such a qualitative state space would be enough to recreate the image after that. <clears throat> not to mention that if you have a lot of images, it might not be easy to go through them all such that you can engineer that state space, such that you can try and project the images to the state space. Because you know, even if you come up with the right state space, then how do you, do, how do you engineer a fluffiness detector, so to speak? So at that point, I guess it becomes sort of clear that most of the things we look to 
used when describing the data is contained in the data. And it might be easier to infer the latent uh, representation Z plus the compressor, the encoder or the decoder. It might be easier to learn them from data rather than sit down and engineer them. Um, especially, you know, when the cardinalities of Z and uh, of X and Z grow to become too big and when we have too much data at hand. And, you know, when usually when we talk about visual data, neural networks, which are just a variation of high parameter model, are what people use nowadays to, to sort of learn these kind of representations. So because we're lazy, we're going to use something called an autoencoder. Now, I don't know how, much, how many of you have used something like this, but the basic idea is that if we take um, a handwritten data set like MNIST, these are 70,000 images of people having written the digits between zero and uh, nine. If we take it and we feed it through that model, essentially what it does is it takes a single image and it basically feeds it through a sequence of layers where each layer, the more it progresses uh, you know, downstream, becomes smaller, so to speak. So it has less dimensions until it hits the information bottleneck in the middle. After that, you start sort of reversing the process where you take that information here and you try to reconstruct the same image you fed in. So that's basically the objective you use when you train the model. You have your input, you have your output, you have your latent representation here, which is still keeping up the same notation as the previous slide. You have your encoder parameterized by phi and decoder parameterized by theta, but more importantly, the objective function you give your optimizer and you let it loose at the data set is essentially this. You're telling it to try to make the, the thing that comes out or the output as close as possible to the input while still feeding it through this lower dimensional bottleneck here. So that's all nice and cool, still you know, keeping up the spirit of compressing visual information. But if you actually look at that, at an example of such a model being trained, things are not looking so beautiful. So what we have here is a two-dimensional latent bottleneck of, a, of an autoencoder, which we've trained with the MNIST data set. And these are the same model, but three different times we've trained it with the same data. <clears throat> and what we can observe is that essentially there are no guarantees about, let's say, the shape of the latent space we're going to end up hitting, right? If you look at here, for example, the data occupies mostly the second quadrant of a two-dimensional space. Here we're in the first quadrant, here we're in the third quadrant. So the notion, of, the notion of us being able to tap into that latent space post-training and generating new images, like with the bar example, is not that trivial because you don't even know where in that two-dimensional space you want to tap, to tap into. So, sorry, what is latent space? <clears throat> um, latent space is this thing here. So you remember how in the first example we had 16 dimensional images or four by four? Yeah. Those were 16 dimensional high, high dimensionality. So it's not very easy to, to sort of interpret. As in the possible points you can have in that, in, in that high dimensional space is a lot. But in reality, that high dimensional space is very sparse. Meaning that the images we had in, as an example occupy only a small chunk of that 16 them, yeah. And therefore, we can easily represent the same notions or the same concepts by using a latent representation, meaning that that's a representation you don't observe directly. But you can infer it, or you can engineer it, or you can derive it somehow from the 16-dimensional space. Uh, so you're kind of filling the blanks then. So you have <coughs> that, and it's looking at certain parts of that image, let's say. It does not occupy those 16 blocks. There are some blanks there, and there needs to be some interpretation to make sense You can think of it like this, yes. Right. Or alternatively, if you have, for example, these images are 28 by 28 by 1, which is like 700 dimensional space. In reality, in order to generate images like this, you might need only two values, not 700 values, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, maybe we can discuss it offline more. I have more examples. Uh, Fair enough. Uh, so this is the latent space or the code or the compressed version of the image, if you will, that's uh, not very beautiful, let's say. So what people have done is that they've borrowed ideas from variational inference. So that basically means that we still have the same landscape, so to speak, 
but instead of treating it, treating the reconstruction loss, which says make the output this close to the input, we're gonna look at it from a probabilistic point of view. But so far you can ignore that, that's not that important. The important bit is here, where we're saying that we have some prior distribution over those latent codes. And we want the distribution we learn in the latent codes to be as close as possible to that prior. That basically means if I have a two-dimensional space again, and I want my codes here that I learned to, to, to be sort of looking like a two-dimensional Gaussian with diagonal covariance, this guy basically allows me to impose that on the, on the optimization process. And that becomes a bit more clear in the next slide where again, three different types, I've trained the same model on the same data, but now we can see that most of the data is sort of centered at zero, zero, and it doesn't go beyond minus four, four, minus four, four. And regardless of how many times I train it, the data always gets centered at that place. So after that at test time, I can sample myself a new data point from a 2D Gaussian. I can feed it through my decoder and I can get an image. So that might even be an image that was never in the data set. And that's sort of the beauty of this kind of models that you're saying that all the information you have in the black and white images, you can compress it to a two dimensional representation, which you know how to sample, and then you can generate yourself a new, a new set of images almost. Which is pretty cool, but still, I mean, if I wanna sample a digit, I sample a two dimensional, a point from a two dimensional Gaussian, I reconstruct it, then I get the new image. But I can't deterministically sample a one, for example or a three, and I should have mentioned that, but the, the color essentially signifies the class of the digit. So if you can see, they're pretty randomly scattered around that space, so to speak, which is where the disentangling bit from the title kicks in. So when I'm talking about disentangling, you can think of, uh, as in disentangled, factorized, independent, they're the same thing. And that's easily explained if you look at the field of graphics or inverse graphics. So let's imagine that you, know, you have a task, you're a graphic designer, and it's a simple task which is generate me a scene with a cube. So you go to Blender, for example, or whatever your favorite graphics engine is. Uh, not a graphic designer, so I might be butchering the terminology, but um, you generate yourself a cube. And normally when you do that, there are certain parameters which can vary. So for example, where is the cube in the scene? How is it rotated? How big is it? What kind of color does it have? Et cetera, et cetera. And all these, all these things are essentially independent from each other. So I can change, for example, the size of the cube without changing its color or position or anything else. And then capturing this sort of compressed version of the whole scene can be fed through my rendering agent engine and I get an image. Now the field of inverse graphics does the opposite. If I give you an image, can you generate me a set of factors of variations that essentially describe the image, again, in this kind of independent fashion. Um, and again, keeping the notation consistent, this is the Z, this is X, and X can be bajillion values, very high dimensional, X could be 10 dimensional. So in this case, Z is the latent space, X is the thing you observe, so to speak. Better? Right. Um, Awesome, so if we go back to MNIST, for example, if we assume we have learned such a disentangled representation, which is Z in this case, and let's say Z is three-dimensional. If we go to Z and we perturb it, for example, Z1, this corresponds to perturbing the class of the digit. If we perturb Z2, this corresponds to how slanted the digit is. Z3 corresponds to, what was it, how thick it is. But the point is that walking that space, so to speak, one axis at a time, changes only the attribute this axis is responsible for. It doesn't change anything else. And that's pretty cool because you, know, you still get that lower dimensional representation from the high dimensional visual input, but now it's also interpretable. As in, you can sample a bunch of points by changing only one dimension at a time. You can reconstruct it, all these are reconstructions, and you can sort of subjectively judge what that dimension is responsible for encoding. So, Yes, how would one do that in the, bit, in, in, the, in the VAE framework that I had a couple of slides ago? So people with deep mind have said, well, you know that loss function I showed you? You just put a parameter or a coefficient at this thing that I told you tells the optimizer how much attention to pay, how much attention to pay to the shape of the latent space. 
and they hypothesized that by increasing this guy up or down, you can essentially tell the optimizer how much attention to pay to that shape. Now, one nice thing about using Gaussians with diagonal covariance matrices is that they say that the different dimensions that span the, the, the space on top of which the Gaussian is fit are independent. So this is, an independent, this is a, a Gaussian with a diagonal covariance, this is not. And that's not nice because this essentially means that there's a correlation between, if this is x1 and x2, there's a correlation there, right? As x1 grows, so does x2, and as it goes down, so does x2, while here, as x1 grows, there's no explicit relationship with the other parameter. That's why they're independent. And if I go there and perturb it one at a time, I would generate images that differ only along a single data generative factor of variation, visually speaking. So essentially the extra pressure you impose by tuning that parameter tells your latent space how much to disentangle the different dimensions and how much to compress it towards the zero. Now, Ramping up that thing to 1,000 is also not a great idea because that would essentially compress all the data to zero and you would end up reconstructing the same image all the time. But maybe that's a story for another time. Uh, and the experiments they do is with the synthetic data set, they call it these sprites, and there are six factors of variation underlyingly. Maybe color not because it's a single color, but the shape, the scale, the orientation, they all vary. And some of them are sort of continuous, some of them are categorical. And so they fit their beta VAE by very nicely tuning the beta parameter first. And what they see is that indeed, so these are all individual dimensions in the Z space. By perturbing them one at a time, the samples they generate in the end sort of vary along a single of those factors of variation that they have as ground truth anyway. So this must be Z zero, that's Y position, X position. So if you sort of walk up, you can see that nothing else more or less changes but the X position on the image. Here, for example, it is what? It's rotation, even though that's not that obvious. Here, it's, uh, it's a scale, etc. And if you compare that to a vanilla variation of autoencoder, which I showed you at the beginning, which had the nice shape, but had the, cl the cluster scattered, if you, tr if you try to do the same experiment, traversing the individual dimensions does not give you sensible results, right? That's pretty cool, and I guess that's a good time for a quick recap in case uh, I lost you along the way. So we've discussed briefly the idea of, you know, you have high dimensional image observations in this case. We want to be able to compress them to lower dimensional representations, and we want to be able to go back maybe. Even though for the second half of the talk, I mainly talk about this part here. Even though I train it as the full thing, but maybe you're going to see what I mean later on. Um, and we also said that we care about that latent space being interpretable, and we showed how if that, space, uh, if that space is disentangled or factorized or the different axes represent independent factors of variation, visually speaking, we can assume that it's interpretable, even though we have to sort of post hoc evaluate what each dimension means. And we've said that, you know, as our sort of machine, we're gonna use a VAE, which is just a fancy neural network, because that's what's fashionable nowadays, I guess. However, one thing I didn't tell you is that I sort of hinted at it. Judging what dimension from the latent code corresponding to, corresponds to what in terms of visual variations, it's a bit of a tricky thing because essentially what you have to do is you have to learn that low dimensional latent space and then you have to do a bunch of samples from it. You have to reconstruct the images, hope the images are meaningful, and then subjectively go and say, well, I varied only Z0 and nothing else changed by, but the scale. Therefore, Z0 must be scale, et cetera. What I'm exploring in the, last, in, the, in the second part of the talk is, well, what if we want certain guarantees about the meaning of these latent, uh, latent codes we end up learning, right? We're gonna have to sacrifice the unsupervised training regime by using some labels, but at the same time, it's not gonna be a fully supervised setup, meaning that we're gonna have weak labels that might give us certain guarantees about the shape of the latent space, but we're still gonna be a, bit, a little bit lazy. Now to clarify that last bit, the nice thing here is that there was no supervision. So all the, the GIF you essentially saw with all the images or the MNIST images, I could let my model use these images without the classes. I didn't have to tell it this is a one, this is a five, this is a three, et cetera. You just let it take the image, pass it through the compression bit, then decompress it, and because it has to learn how to reconstruct 
input-output pairs. It's unsupervised from the point of view of you don't need an annotator to sit down and say, that's this, that's that, et cetera. So you don't use the class label, so to speak. What I'm saying here is that maybe we can use some of the class labels for the sake of having some guarantees about the shape of the latent space. Any questions so far? I guess that's a good point for, yeah? Is it possible to kind of get like these kind of natural variations without entropy hinting? Because you've been exposing it like, you know, when you transverse a paper, you kind of thought that to be the case, right? Uh, not necessarily. So the bit where I traverse the latent space is once I've learned the latent space or the codes, so to speak. I start by knowing nothing about that Z space, so to speak. I just tell my model, you have to learn to, to compress an image to that 10 dimensional space, for example, and you have to learn to reconstruct an image from the 10 dimensional space. And maybe I have some constraints on the 10 dimensional space in terms of what kind of distribution, uh, what kind of distribution should the data look like in there. But I've not told it Z1 is rotation, Z5 is exposition, et cetera. This is sort of post hoc me interpreting what these dimensions mean. And that comes from for free from the model because of the training regime and the different constraints you have in the optimization process. Yeah? Maybe we can talk more offline after that if, if that's still confusing. Um, any other questions? No? Right, so for the remaining part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about two of the papers I have, which sort of utilize everything I've mentioned so far, plus one step further. So what do I mean by that? The first one is called Interpretable Latent Spaces for Learning from Demonstration. And the setup is the following. So imagine we have a robot in the scene and maybe we wanna teach it certain things about the, yeah, you have, you have to have the mandatory bubble thing and the robot and some Lego things, because robots are not even as smart as children, so. You need toys, because they're easy to experiment with. But um, where was I? So you have a setup where maybe I wanna teach my robot certain things about the objects in the world. So maybe I have a certain sorting task that I'm performing and I'm separating the red ones from the blue ones and the big ones from the small ones, something like this. Long story short is that it can utilize the, the things I utter while I perform the task and it can use them as labels for certain observations it makes. Now, Pay attention here that I'm not labeling everything the robot sees in the scene, right? Um, so we take that as our data set. We have some labels that are categorical and we have the grouping between them. So by grouping, I mean, I know that, I know that red and blue are a thing on their own and I know that ball and cube are a thing on their own. So semantically speaking, it knows that these things are separate from these things. It doesn't necessarily know the notion of redness or blueness or anything like this. So we feed that through the, to our friend, the DAE, which you've seen a couple of slides ago. And we, can, we reconstruct all the images we feed through. Now, the additional constraint I have here is that some of the latent space dimensions I also use to classify the labels associated with a particular image. And I, I argue that that gives me more control over what that dimension represents. So in this case, if we zoom in, is meant to be the 2D, uh, 2D space of those two latent dimensions. So we can basically see that you know, this guy represents color, this guy represents, it's either shape or size, I'm not quite sure, it must be shape. Um, but the point is that you, know, you have these flag posts almost that are defined by the labels and because we're trying to discriminate between those labels, they're sort of being pushed out from the zero as much as possible. The nice thing is that the, the other kind of information that again semantically aligns with the labels, in this case green and yellow, sort of follows the same pattern. So you still end up with a disentangled latent space. The difference here is that I know what Z1 is and I know what Z2 is. So I can later on use them for, to perform inference in terms of classifying new data points. The other nice thing is that I can say, well, I can fit Gaussians on top of my my label clusters, and because these things are 1D, I can simply think them of them as 1D Gaussians, which are pretty easy to both visualize and work with. But I'm also gonna fit an unknown distribution between them, right? Because that space had to be filled in, mainly because these, so this axis had to be used both to classify but also to reconstruct, right? 
So it had to put the yellow stuff somewhere and the green stuff somewhere such that it can reconstruct the images later on. So the best place it found was in between the two clusters for the labeled classes. So long story short is that I can have an unknown cluster and after that if I show it a set of new objects, it wouldn't misclassify them. It would, through using um, nearest neighbors, if you know what I'm, if you know that what that is, I can basically say, well, I'm going to project this data point, for example, to that latent space, and depending on whether it falls more under the unknown distribution than any of the two other distributions, I can basically say, well, it's a ball, but it's an unknown color, and that's sort of nice because it allows you to conceptualize the world in a better and more human, natural way, right? We don't treat the, the, the object as a single label on its own, right? Um, pink ball, for example, is not a label out of 10 labels. It's sort of a, a, a multi-class labeling scenario, so to speak. Um, that's the model arch architecture. So again, this is the DAE. And this is the loss function that we had a couple of slides back. The new thing is this classifier here, which essentially says that you know, a bunch of these dimensions are gonna be responsible for reconstructing, but they're also gonna be responsible for classifying the different images that designate certain qualitative properties of the, of the images. And because we do this separation, you know, concept group per axis explicitly, we can say that, well, Z1 is color, Z1 is shape, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we do study what effect does that utilization of the data set have. So for example, we do, we do check what happens if we just have the vanilla beta VA, so no classification, or what happens if we just classify? Because you know, whenever you have labels, the straightforward solution is to just do a classifier. Like why would you have your reconstruction bit here? And go back. Like why would you have, you know, normally when you have labels, this is where things stop, right? You predict a set of values, you softmax them, and whatever is most likely in terms of a, of a label, that's what you predict. Like why would you use this you know, clunky bit here that complicates the model and makes learning harder? Well, that's what we check by, by having this, this bit here. And the natural sort of intuition is that if you use the labels, you only utilize part of the data set because the data sets we have, so for example, it's easier to see here. It's again the disprites data set, but colored. So for example, the kind of labels we give the agent are two out of the three shapes, two out of the, two, two out of the three sizes, and two out of the eight colors. So one hue of blue and one hue of red. So this is all the labeled information the agent sees, right? So that essentially means that if I wanna train only a classifier, I can use only 20% of my data set. The rest sort of goes to the bin. And the kind of evaluation we perform on the learned latent space after that is first we check how much are the concept groups we have aligned with the latent axes. And unfortunately, I don't have slides for that, but if you're curious, you can look at the paper or I can talk about it later on. Uh, what we more thoroughly examine is to what extent can I classify then the new labels or the sort of unseen labels um, after I project them to the Z space, right? So essentially, to what extent can I separate this distribution from this distribution from the thing in the middle that's unknown? And the main point to be taken away from this very big and cluttered slide is that the red bar is what we are, and we're sort of consistently overperforming the other two baselines, meaning that there is some value in injecting labels in the, in the, in the data set, but, it's, but there's also definitely some value in utilizing the unlabeled part of the data set, meaning that, again, the intuition is that the labels sort of put flag posts in the latent space and the, re, the, the reconstruction sort of fills in the gap such that it can still do its job, um, but it also respects the constraints we put in. So that's the second paper, that's the first paper. The second paper has to do with learning representations that, um, on top of which we can ground symbols that designate inter-object relationships. And I guess I still have time to go through it, correct? Right, so yeah, no robots unfortunately, we're mainly gonna deal with this sort of synthetic world which was generated procedurally through a blender. So I guess the ethos of the paper is that you have partially labeled data set again, like you have the weak supervision we talked about, but the weak supervision here comes in the form of, if you have a bunch of objects in the scene, you don't have to exhaustively label all the relationships these objects respect with each other, spatially speaking, right? 
So the point is that you have this kind of a data set, you feed it through your model, and you hope that the latent space you learn in the middle would encompass um, the labels that determine the spatial relationships the object satisfy in the scene, right? And the kind of relationships I'm talking about is, you know, this thing is to the, to the right, uh, the, the yellow cube is to the right of the blue ball, or it's above the tray, or this thing is in the tray, et cetera. So all these relationships that can be satisfied in the image, they're heuristically derived, but only partially um, describing a given scene, such that, you know, if you imagine a setup where a human is meant to teach a robot these things, you don't want them to exhaustively sit there and you know, label 1,000 images and each image has 12 relationships. Like that's just too much annotating burden, so to speak. So the logic is that maybe we can put some labels in, in the form of 10 or 20% of the data and not label the whole data, but still use the whole data. Such that at test time, this is the more interesting part, at test time, once we've learned the latent space on top of which we have the spatial symbols, we can get a new demonstration, and that's meant to be going through time, where we sequentially stack a set of objects on top of each other. On an image by image basis, we can project it to the latent space, and then you know say that you know this time st this this demonstration was maybe 30 frames worth, but in reality there are two things that are happening. First, the blue the blue object is moving and getting on top of the red object, and then the green object is going on the blue object. And, you know, getting the fact that there are two things or two steps and sort of describing the steps in terms of what kind of relationships are the objects satisfying eventually is the, the key challenge, so to speak. So we still have a big fat neural network there, for good or bad, but the setup is slightly different. So you still take images, but now we have also depth information, which is basically like a range um, estimation from the camera. So essentially white means further away, black means closer. And the other sort of added modality is the semantic mask corresponding to each object. Now here we sort of cheat because we use a procedurally generated environment, meaning that the graphical, uh, the, the rendering engine can give us the, the mask for the object. For the real world experiment, which I don't have here, but is in the paper, we essentially train the segmentation model, which if you give it a tabletop setup with objects and you've trained it to recognize the objects, it can basically produce the same things with the labels and with the bounding boxes. But the point is that given a single image like this of two objects, maybe there are more objects, but the fact that you have the masks allows you to separate pairs of objects uh, together with the object labels and the relationship labels that we've described the scene with. We feed them through a variation of auto encoder again now the, the key thing here is that we're reconstructing only the, the part of the image that corresponds to the object itself. And that more or less allows us to think of that bottleneck space here, which was the Z space in the previous paper, as an object embedding, right? This thing here should ideally tell us the color, the size, the shape, the position, maybe the pose, etc. So if we concatenate the two compressed versions of the objects and we feed them through a third module, we end up with our relationship embedding space. Or, um, you know, instead of Z, we have C here, but it's pretty much the same thing. We're basically taking high dimensional manifolds and by feeding them through a set of affine transformations, which is what the neural network does, you sort of squish them and stretch them, you never tear them apart. But um, they are meant to be topologically equivalent, so to speak. Um, and so this is essentially the bit that we're after because after that, we can do the same thing. We can parameterize the latent clusters corresponding to different labels as Gaussian distribution. So we have left from right to be C1, far from close to be C2, et cetera. And additionally, we have a set of object labels that we predict from the object embeddings, which is an additional constraint. But we argue that this allows us to learn better object embeddings that then, la uh, then later on allows us to learn better relationship embeddings. And for the sake of clarity, embedding, latent space, those are meant to be interchangeable terms. We have an even fatter loss function that we optimize. Still, we have a KL term, which says what kind of distribution the data distribution be or look like. We have a reconstruction term, and we have the classification terms for both the object labels and the relationship labels. And so, again, if you think about that in the classical paradigm, this could easily be, you know, you cut this part, cut this part. This is just a classifier, right? By utilizing 
these other modalities, or not modalities, but um, terms of the loss function, we argue that those can capture additional information that is present in the data set, but would be otherwise unutilized. And we check through a set of, through set of annihilation studies how much that does that influence the properties of the space we learn. So what are these representations useful for? Well, we're trying to infer a plan, as I said in the first slide, and that looks like the following thing. So if we get, hope that's not too small, but essentially that's an image of a reference object and a bunch of target objects. Target object means that the object moves, reference object means that the object is static. So knowing the reference object before we start the process can essentially segment it into pairs of objects. And knowing this kind of, having this kind of information, we project it to the learned embedding space for, uh, on top of which we have the relational, the, the relational labels. And so as the demonstration unfolds through time, so do the embeddings for each pair of objects. And by looking at how much do, does the embedding at time step t plus one move with respect to the embedding at time t, we can essentially say whether the red cube moved with respect to the red cylinder from time t to t plus one, which essentially allows us to draw sort of imaginary lines through, the, through time uh, while we observe the demonstration, which basically tells us this is how many steps the plan has, and this is what the steps roughly mean in terms of the red moves and the blue moves and the green moves. Now we're, on tr we're also interested in knowing where do they move to, right? Not only that they move, but for that, we pull out our Gaussian distributions and essentially for any chunk of the embedding trace we get, if we say that the object moves from T to T plus N, we essentially try to, to see what kind of relation, through what kind of relationships does the target object go through such that eventually we know that you know, initially it was off, then it's on. So how do we test that? So for the first one, we generate a set of, we call them repetitive behaviors. And here again, you have a single reference object and three target objects, which sequentially move such that they go from satisfying label one to satisfying label two from a single concept group. So left to right or out to in or off and off, off and on. And on top of that, we do our ablation study. So each row is meant to represent a model we trained by essentially tuning the, uh, the, um, the coefficients we had in the big loss function. So pay attention to the last row because that's the full model which essentially utilizes the full data set and it sort of performs re uh, reasonably well with respect to this one because it, we hypothesized it's a bit too noisy. Because remember that these things, the truthness of these relationships, ground truth speaking, are determined heuristically. So, you know, in and out is not that easy to resolve if you end up writing 10 if statements. And that's sort of the beauty of learning them. But in order to show that you've learned them, you need to sort of engineer the heuristics that you would have anyway. Anyway, um, in order to see whether we can identify how does a given target object change relationships with respect to a reference object, we have a set of chain behavior. So here you have a single target object continuously moving, so we don't have to say when does it stop move and when does it start move. But while it moves, it continuously jumps, so to speak, between different relationships it satisfies. So if you look at here, you know, first it's off, then it's on, then it's off, right? So in order to evaluate that, you need to give the, the, the algorithm more than one demonstration because if I just show it this one, it would still tell me that it goes from on off to on to off, but it might as well tell me that it goes from being to the right to being to something that it can't really tell me what it is to being to the right again. And in reality, if I'm demonstrating the ta a task, that might over explain the task I'm demonstrating. Therefore, it was interesting to see if I demonstrate the same task, but with varying conditions, would it be able to extract the true ground truth plan, so to speak. And more or less as, as expected, this is essentially the, the error, which is zero, not the error, but uh, yeah. So this is the edit distance between the inferred plants and the ground truth plants. And this is how many steps the plant has. So the more observations it has, the closer it is to the real plan. And that sort of makes sense because what it's doing is it's inferring a plan for you know, demo one, demo two, demo three, demo four. And it's trying to take the most invariant information that still ex explains the demonstration, so to speak. So oh, 40 minutes later, I guess that was a lot of information, maybe not that useful, but I hope it was interesting. And I'm gonna be around if you have questions.
But long story short is that this thing I call, or you know, the, the literature calls disentangled representations have useful properties, at least for me, from an HRI, human-robot interaction point of view. And um, you know, my argument was that learning such representations in a completely unsupervised way is doable and it's actually pretty attractive, but it only gets us that much, you know, far into the, far along the way, or I don't know how to explain it exactly. But the point is that if we want to have more insights into what the learned representations mean, and we if we want to have more control over what's being disentangled over what, we need the, the weak labels because I didn't have that, but the way the disentangling works in the unsupervised fashion is that the model sequentially picks factors of variation that makes the most sense in terms of reconstruction. So for example, maybe I can finish, then I can give my example. So for example, with the digits, if you want, if you imagine that the digits had different x, y positions and you only had a two-dimensional z-space, it would make more sense for the model to start reconstructing a blob that's consistently moving throughout the sort of the image, but it's still a blob because in terms of the pixel level loss, it makes more sense to give you a, a, a white blob with the right coordinates instead of a correct digit at the wrong place because the latter one has a bigger error. And because you train these things in expectation, it's sort of, if you have low, low, low capacity there, it's gonna disentangle whatever it makes sense to itself, so to speak, or whatever makes sense to the optimization process. That's why if you introduce weak labels, you sort of pin down the model and you tell it, this dimension is gonna mean this, and you're not gonna deviate from that. Uh, so that's more or less the moral of the story. So I guess if you're doing machine learning in industry, how does that relate to me? Very quickly. Long story short for me is that supervised learning is what works best, especially in industry, if you want something to perform with, within certain error bounds. Now, all the stuff I presented here was talking about unsupervised learning, which is exactly the opposite. Um, I guess unsupervised learning is nice, especially if you have a huge data set with no labels. So for example, if you're front, front uh, a customer facing company, Maybe you have a lot of data there, but you don't have all the labels with that data. Uh, and you might be tempted to try and you know, extract certain properties from that data by doing the unsupervised way. However, that might not give you all the results you expect, which is where you might want to sit down and label, let's say 20% of the data set, which is much better than 100, and get a better result than sitting down and labeling the 100% of it. Like if you, if you have the, the resources, label everything, and that's going to work like a charm. But usually annotating data correctly is quite painful and quite hard. So this is sort of a, a middle ground, so to speak. And that's me. <laughs>